stat key has the ability to do this too. So I'm going to swap over there. So here I am on stat key and we're now going to be looking at the column on the right hand side that says randomization hypothesis tests. And then we have to pick out what kind of parameter we have. And so I wrote out my hypotheses earlier and it was about mu sub b for the branded tape and mu sub p for the plain tape. So there's two means, it's a difference in means. So I'm gonna to go to randomization hypothesis tests, test for difference in means. And then this data set isn't available in StatKey, so I'm gonna to need to upload it. All right, so now I've uploaded my data and you can see the plot of the original sample there. The ones with the branded tape are the purple dots and the ones with the plain tape are the kind of orangey brown dots. And we can see the means of those two groups and the observed difference in means negative 3.04. Uh, it looks like they did the subtraction in the opposite direction, but it'll turn out basically the same. And if I click generate one sample, what StatKey is going to do is it is going to reallocate groups. That is, it's going to mix up the labels of branded and plain, and then it's going to uh, use those new branded and plain packages to find the means for those groups and the difference in means. So in this case, it found a difference of 0.27 days and then it puts one dot on the plot for 0.27 days. And if I generate one sample again, then StatKey mixes up those labels again, it finds a different difference in means, um, and puts another dot on the plot. And so I could keep doing this, clicking one sample, one sample, one sample. I could be lazy and click generate 10 samples, or I could be really, really lazy and click generate 1,000 samples. All right, so I'm gonna take a screenshot of this for in my notes. All right, so let's just highlight a few important things here. So we've got our original difference in means, um, and that was from the, uh, the mean for the branded and the mean for the plain. Um, and then we had our observed statistic of negative 3.04. Every time we do a randomization sample, we're going to get one plot here. It's going to find the means, it's going to compute the difference in means, and then it's going to put a dot on the plot wherever that belongs. So this one was negative 1.29, so that's maybe here. Um, and now I have this randomization distribution, which looks vaguely symmetric and bell-shaped. So a randomization distribution is a distribution of statistics from samples assuming that the null hypothesis is true. And looking at the randomization distribution lets us see what kinds of values we could observe just by random chance if the null were true. So if I go back to this plot, um, a lot of the times if the null were true, I would find a difference in means about zero. Sometimes I'd find uh, one, you know, either the branded or the plain tape uh, was, you know, a day or half a day longer or shorter. Sometimes it would go out to a day shorter or longer. And if I was using my kind of 95% rule and kind of eyeballing it, I might say, you know, this looks like the middle 95%. If the null hypothesis were true, most of the time it would be in this region. Um, you, you'd have a difference of plus or minus a day uh, for either one of the, the types of packages. So just a little uh, overview of how a randomization test works. Um, you're always gonna start by writing out your hypotheses. So you're gonna have your null and alternative hypotheses, and you're gonna have to think about what you want to test. So in this case, it was mu sub b minus mu sub p equal to zero, and mu sub p minus mu sub p uh, not equal to zero. But the way that uh, the test itself works is step one, you're going to compute and record your sample statistic. So in this case, x bar b minus x bar p uh, that we really observed, I think that was 3.04 days. And then we're gonna simulate some data that could occur if the null were true. 
So in this case, that means mixing up the values of one variable, uh, reassigning those packages to be um, with the tape or with the not the tape. Um, and then we're going to compute and record the randomization statistic. So we're going to find the mean of our new sort of pretend groups, uh, and we're going to subtract them and write that down. And then we're going to repeat steps two and three a bunch of times, where a bunch of times means a thousand or maybe more times. And then we're going to look at that distribution of randomization statistics. And we want to know how extreme is the observed statistic, the thing from step one, in the context of the distribution. Does it look like a reasonable value or does it look like a not reasonable value to have observed under the null hypothesis? So let me just stick in my screenshot from before again. I'm just going to fill the whole screen here. All right. So I had my observed X bar for the branded tape minus X bar for the plain tape was 3.04. And so what I'd like to do is find that number in the context of the distribution. So looking at this distribution, we've got one, we've got two, we'd have, you know, if we were moving out in this direction, we'd have 2.53, 3.04 would be way out here. So in the context of this distribution, um, 3.04 looks really extreme. Um, so if the null were true, it would be pretty weird to see something as extreme as 3.04. So that gives me some strong evidence against my null hypothesis. Uh, one thing that's good to know about a randomization distribution is because it's simulating the situation where the null is true, it's going to be centered around the number from the null hypothesis. So in this case, we had our null and alternative. Our null was mu branded minus mu plain equal to zero or mu branded minus mu plain not equal to zero. So that number that appeared in the hypothesis was zero. Um, and it's often zero. It's not always zero, but that's a really common number to see. And again, I'm going to drop in the screenshot so we can look at that. So this distribution is centered right around zero. That's the most common thing that we get is uh, differences of about zero between the branded and the plain tape. So from this example, we saw that 3.04 would be really extreme. It would be way out in the tails. So we have strong evidence against the null. The null hypothesis, when that's true, here are the kind of things that we get most often. In the middle of this distribution, we were way out in the tail. But it's not always the case that it's really easy to tell just from looking at the plot. Sometimes it's a little bit more ambiguous. So uh, we need a standardized way to decide. And that's where the p-value comes in. And a p-value is just the proportion of the distribution that's as extreme or more extreme than the observed statistic. And that might sound familiar from when we were talking about z-scores and converting back and forth from normal distributions. We'd often do percentiles. You know, where's the top 25%? A p-value is just, you know, what percent is more extreme than this number? So if you have a small p-value, that means there's lots of evidence against the null hypothesis. That's what we had in this case. And if you had a large p-value, that would mean you don't have much evidence against the null hypothesis. Uh, and uh, that, that wasn't the case here, but sometimes you'll see that. Uh, sometimes it's hard to remember how these two things connect. And I had a student a few semesters ago who told me this mnemonic device, which is uh, if the p-value is low, the null hypothesis has got to go. So you're going to reject the null. P-value is low. Null hypothesis has got to go. Uh, so that might help you remember. Um, and then you have to think about where to look in the distribution. And it depends on the type of alternative hypothesis that you have. So if your alternative hypothesis has a greater than sign, then you're going to be looking in the upper tail. You're going to be looking at this area up here. If your null hypothesis has a less than sign, you're going to be looking in the lower tail, that's down here, 
And if your null hypothesis has a not equal sign, then you're going to be looking at both sides. You're going to look at the upper and the lower tails. Um, sometimes we call it a two-tail test. So uh, the case that we were talking about, we were actually doing a two-tail test because we had a not equal sign in our alternative hypothesis. And as we go on in this chapter, we're going to learn how to formalize this even more.